Chapter 16 There was nothing to drink on the Sophie Sutherland, and we had fifty-one days of glorious sailing, taking the southern passage in the northeast trades to Bonin Islands. This isolated group, belonging to Japan, had been selected as the rendezvous of the Canadian and American sealing fleets. Here they filled their water barrels and made repairs before starting on the hundred days harrying of the seal herd along the northern coast of Japan to Bering Sea. Those fifty-one days of fine sailing and intense sobriety had put me in splendid fettle. The alcohol had been worked out of my system, and from the moment the voyage began I had not known the desire for a drink. I doubt if I even thought once about a drink. Often, of course, the talk in the forecastle turned to drink, and the men told of their more exciting or humorous drunks, remembering such passages more keenly, with greater delight than all the other passages of their adventurous lives. In the forecastle, the oldest man, fat and fifty, was Lewis. He was a broken skipper. John Barleycorn had thrown him, and he was winding up his career where he had begun it, in the forecastle. His case made quite an impression on me. John Barleycorn did other things besides kill a man. He hadn't killed Lewis. He had done much worse. He had robbed him of power and place and comfort crucified his pride, and condemned him to the hardship of the common sailor that would last as long as his healthy breath lasted, which promised to be for a long time. We completed our run across the Pacific, lifted the volcanic peaks, jungle-clad, of the Bonin Islands, sailed in among the reefs to the landlocked harbor, and let our ankle rumble down where lay a score or more of sea gypsies like ourselves. The scents of strange vegetation blew off the tropic land. Aborigines in queer outrigger canoes and Japanese in queerer sampans paddled about the bay and came aboard. It was my first foreign land. I had won to the other side of the world, and I would see all I had read in the books come true. I was wild to get ashore. Victor and Axel, a Swede and a Norwegian, and I planned to keep together. And so well did we that for the rest of the cruise we were known as the Three Sports. Victor pointed out a pathway that disappeared up a wild canyon, emerged on a steep bare lava slope, and thereafter appeared and disappeared ever climbing among the palms and flowers. We would go over that path, he said, and we agreed, and we would see beautiful scenery and strange native villages, and find, heaven alone knew, what adventure at the end. And Axel was keen to go fishing. The three of us agreed to that, too. We would get a sampan and a couple of Japanese fishermen who knew the fishing grounds, and we would have great sport. As for me, I was keen for anything. And then, our plans made, we rowed ashore over the banks of living coral and pulled our boat up the white beach of coral sand. 
we walked across the fringe of beach under the coconut palms and into the little town and found several hundred riotous seamen from all the world drinking prodigiously singing prodigiously dancing prodigiously and all on the main street to the scandal of a helpless handful of japanese police victor and axel said that we'd have a drink before we started on our long walk could i decline to drink with these two chesty shipmates drinking together glass in hand put the seal on comradeship it was the way of life our teetotaler owner captain was laughed at and sneered at by all of us because of his teetotalism i didn't in the least want a drink but i did want to be a good fellow and a good comrade nor did lewis's case deter me as i poured the biting scorching stuff down my throat john barleycorn had thrown lewis to a nasty fall but i was young my blood ran full and red i had a constitution of iron and well youth ever grins scornfully at the wreckage of age queer fierce alcoholic stuff it was that we drank there was no telling where or how it had been manufactured some native concoction most likely but it was hot as fire pale as water and quick as death with its kick it had been filled into empty square-faced bottles which had once contained holland gin and which still bore the fitting legend anchor brand it certainly anchored us we never got out of the town we never went fishing in the sampan and though we were there ten days we never trod that wild path along the lava cliffs and among the flowers we met old acquaintances from other schooners fellows we had met in the saloons of san francisco before we sailed and each meeting meant a drink and there was much to talk about and more drinks and songs to be sung and pranks and antics to be performed until the maggots of imagination began to crawl and it all seemed great and wonderful to me these lusty hard-bitten sea rovers of whom i made one gathered in with sail on a coral strand old lines about knights at table in the great banquet halls and of those above the salt and below the salt and of vikings feasting fresh from sea and ripe for battle came to me and i knew that the old times were not dead and that we belonged to that self-same ancient breed by mid-afternoon victor went mad with drink and wanted to fight everybody and everything i have since seen lunatics in the violent wards of asylums that seemed to behave in no wise different from victor's way save that perhaps he was more violent axel and i interfered as peacemakers were roughed and jostled in the mix-ups and finally with infinite precaution and intoxicated cunning succeeded in inveigling our chum down to the boat and in rowing him aboard our schooner but no sooner did victor's feet touch the deck than he began to clean up the ship he had the strength of several men and he ran amuck with it i remember especially one man whom he got into the chain boxes but failed to damage through inability to hit him 
The man dodged and ducked, and Victor broke all the knuckles of both his fists against the huge links of the anchor chain. By the time we dragged him out of that, his madness had shifted to the belief that he was a great swimmer, and the next moment he was overboard and demonstrating his ability by floundering like a sick porpoise and swallowing much sea water. We rescued him, and by the time we got him below, undressed and into his bunk, we were wrecks ourselves. But Axel and I wanted to see more of shore, and away we went, leaving Victor snoring. It was curious, the judgment passed on Victor by his shipmates, drinkers themselves. They shook their heads disapprovingly and muttered, A man like that oughtn't to drink. Now Victor was the smartest sailor and best-tempered shipmate in the forecastle. He was an all-around splendid type of seaman. His mates recognized his worth and respected him and liked him. Yet John Barleycorn metamorphosed him into a violent lunatic. And that was the very point these drinkers made. They knew that drink, and drink with a sailor is always excessive, made them mad, but only mildly mad. Violent madness was objectionable because it spoiled the fun of others and often culminated in tragedy. From their standpoint, mild madness was all right, but from the standpoint of the whole human race, is not all madness objectionable? And is there a greater maker of madness of all sorts than John Barleycorn? But to return. Ashore, snugly ensconced in a Japanese house of entertainment, Axel and I compared bruises, and over a comfortable drink, talked of the afternoon's happenings. We liked the quietness of that drink and took another. A shipmate dropped in, several shipmates dropped in, and we had more quiet drinks. Finally, just as we had engaged a Japanese orchestra, and as the first strains of the Samasens and Takos were rising, through the paper walls came a wild howl from the street. We recognized it. Still howling, disdaining doorway, with bloodshot eyes and wildly waving muscular arms, Victor burst upon us through the fragile walls. The old amuck rage was on him, and he wanted blood, anybody's blood. The orchestra fled, so did we. We went through doorways, and we went through paper walls, anything to get away. And after the place was half-wrecked, and we had agreed to pay the damage, leaving Victor partly subdued and showing symptoms of lapsing into a comatose state, Axel and I wandered away in quest of a quieter drinking place. The main street was a madness. Hundreds of sailors rollicked up and down. Because the chief of police with his small force was helpless, the governor of the colony had issued orders to the captains to have all their men on board by sunset. What? to be treated in such a fashion. As the news spread among the schooners, they were emptied. Everybody came ashore. Men who had had no intention of coming ashore climbed into the boats. The unfortunate governor's ukaz had precipitated a general debauch for all hands. It was hours after sunset and the men wanted to see anybody try to put them on board. 
they went around inviting the authorities to try to put them on board in front of the governor's house they were gathered thickest bawling sea songs circulating square faces and dancing uproarious virginia reels and old country dances the police including the reserves stood in little forlorn groups waiting for the command the governor was too wise to issue and i thought this saturnalia was great it was like the old days of the spanish main come back it was license it was adventure and i was part of it a chesty sea rover along with all these other chesty sea rovers among the paper houses of japan the governor never issued the order to clear the streets and axel and i wandered on from drink to drink after a time in some of the antics getting hazy myself i lost him i drifted along making new acquaintances downing more drinks getting hazier and hazier i remember somewhere sitting in a circle with japanese fishermen kanaka boat steerers from our own vessels and a young danish sailor fresh from cowboying in the argentine and with a penchant for native customs and ceremonials and with due and proper and most intricate japanese ceremonial we of the circle drank sake pale mild and lukewarm from tiny porcelain bowls and later i remember the runaway apprentices boys of eighteen and twenty of middle-class english families who had jumped their ships and apprenticeships in various ports of the world and drifted into the forecastles of the sealing schooners they were healthy smooth-skinned clear-eyed and they were young youths like me learning the way of their feet in the world of men and they were men no mild sacky for them but square faces illicitly refilled with corrosive fire that flamed through their veins and burst into conflagrations in their heads i remember a melting song they sang the refrain of which was tis but a little golden ring i give it to thee with pride wear it for your mother's sake when you are on the tide they wept over it as they sang it the graceless young scamps who had all broken their mother's prides and i sang with them and wept with them and luxuriated in the pathos and the tragedy of it and struggled to make glimmering inebriated generalizations on life and romance and one last picture i have standing out very clear and bright in the midst of vagueness before and blackness afterwards we the apprentices and i are swaying and clinging to one another under the stars we are singing a rollicking sea song all save one who sits on the ground and weeps and we are marking the rhythm with waving square faces from up and down the street come far choruses of sea voices similarly singing and life is great and beautiful and romantic and magnificently mad and next after the blackness i open my eyes in the early dawn to see a japanese woman solicitously anxious 
bending over me. She is the port pilot's wife, and I am lying in her doorway. I am chilled and shivering, sick with the after-sickness of debauch. And I feel lightly clad, these rascals of runaway apprentices. They have acquired the habit of running away. They have run away with my possessions. My watch is gone. My few dollars are gone. My coat is gone. So is my belt. And yes, my shoes. And the foregoing is a sample of the ten days I spent in the Bonin Islands. Victor got over his lunacy, rejoined Axel and me, and after that we caroused somewhat more discreetly. And we never climbed that lava path among the flowers. The town and the square faces were all we knew. One who has been burned by fire must preach about the fire. I might have seen and healthily enjoyed a whole lot more of the Bonin Islands if I had done what I ought to have done. But, as I see it, it is not a matter of what one ought to do or ought not to do, it is what one does do. That is the everlasting, irrefragible fact. I did just what I did. I did what all those men did in the Bonin Islands. I did what millions of men over the world were doing at that particular point in time. I did it because the way led to it, because I was only a human boy, a creature of my environment, and neither an anemic nor a god. I was just human, and I was taking the path in the world that men took. Men whom I admired, if you please, full-blooded men, lusty, breedy, chesty men, free spirits, and anything but niggards in the way they foamed life away. And the way was open. It was like an uncovered well in a yard where children play. It is small use to tell the brave little boys toddling their way along with knowledge of life that they mustn't play near the uncovered well. They will play near it, any parent knows that, and we know that a certain percentage of them, the livest and most daring, will fall into the well. The thing to do, we all know it, is to cover up the well. The case is the same with John Barleycorn. All the no-saying and no-preaching in the world will fail to keep men and youths growing into manhood away from John Barleycorn when John Barleycorn is everywhere accessible. And where John Barleycorn is everywhere, the connotation of manliness and daring and great-spiritedness. The only rational thing for the twentieth-century folk to do is to cover up the well. To make the twentieth century in truth the twentieth century, and to relate to the nineteenth century and all the preceding centuries the things of those centuries, the witch-burnings, the intolerances, the fetishes, and not least among such barbarisms, John Barleycorn. End of chapter 16